Neil is an expert on uh, Micronesia. He um, spent years in the Peace Corps. He has a in Micronesia. He has a nonprofit called Habale that works with uh, students in Micronesia. And uh, we just want to bring him up here um, to talk about the problems associated with the poverty and homelessness in the state. Um, let's see. One note today: you're going to hear a phrase a lot called the. Uh, freely associated states, and uh, that's something um, that we that we're going to hear in the presentation. We're talking about um, the Republic of Palau, the Federated States of Micronesia, and uh, the Marshall Islands. So every time you hear FAS or freely associated states today, that's what we're talking about: are those three uh, island states. So, okay. Without further ado, uh, thanks so much, Neil. Let's give a round of Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to come. Uh, and thanks so much for having me, Joe, of course. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, that you're, you're here today because this is something that I feel very strongly about uh, and, and I like to talk about. And so if I go on a little too long, they'll, uh, they'll tell me otherwise. And uh, if you pay attention enough to ask a question, you might even get a Habale t-shirt. Uh, it, it has to sound like it's a smart question that, that you really paid attention. So I'm gonna talk about returning power to Micronesians in Hawaii. And true to the name and the approach of the Grassroots Institute, I'm gonna talk about this at a level that's very fundamental and foundational, um, uh, which is you know, the situation on the ground uh, in Micronesia and the American policies that are so important towards that. So we're going to link the, the flawed foreign aid um, to homelessness here in Hawaii, which for many folks uh, who aren't really familiar with Micronesia would be the most immediate manifestation of this larger problem. And when we talk about this problem, we, I think about it in sort of four interrelated steps. Um, the first is the lack of opportunity within the freely associated states. And we know that because both we, we can ask Micronesians who've come to the US why they came, and they, they, give us, they give us three reasons, education, employment, and healthcare. So we know there, there must be a lack of uh, opportunity there. We can also look at the indicators of of, of the inputs that we've, we've put in and, and how that's translated or not into opportunities. The second step of, of the process uh, is, of course, the ease with which Micronesians can enter the U.S., right? So if they, if they don't have good opportunities, but it's easy for them to go to another place, this seems to sort of make sense. But then comes the, th the third step uh, or, or the third component of this process, which is upon arrival, they have a competitive disadvantage relative uh, to other folks in, in the community. Um, and, and finally, most significantly here in Hawaii, uh, is, is uh, not only are they at a competitive disadvantage, but they're in a place with an enormous cost of living. So the sort of the challenge or the, the cruelty of it almost is, American aid policies have prevented them from having educational employment and healthcare opportunities in their islands. They've taken advantage of their one ticket out. They come here seeking those things, and the combination of the fact that they, they didn't have those options at home and the, the conditions here in terms of cost of living, uh, it, it's sort of like a second round of barriers to those same things that they're seeking. So I'll give a real brief history. In Micronesia, not just a name for these countries, but a name for this term, this part of Hawaii, a, a very storied part of the world in which these tiny islands were seen to be very limited in resources and have been sort of passed around by the great powers uh, of, the, uh, of the world. Uh, the Spanish, the Japanese had designs on them, the Germans had them, the Japanese realized their designs. Uh, there were some disputes about some of the islands, but the Japanese were able to uh, sort of solidify. And right ahead of December 7th, the Japanese had effectively integrated uh, these islands into their, their empire. Uh, and as we know, we're able to uh, use it as a forward deployment base for uh, a lot of aggressive action the next day, um, including obviously taking the last American outpost in the area, Guam. After the war, officials in the Navy, in the Pentagon, said never again. We, we were offered, the U.S. was offered those islands in 1890s and allowed them to fall into Japanese hands and said, we're not going to do this again. And, and took control, directly took control of this region in the form of a trust territory um, uh, and the Department of the Interior essentially ran Micronesia. So today, 
where we talk about this area in terms of the freely associated states. These are independent sovereign nations, Republic of Palau, Republic of Marshall Islands, Federated States of Micronesia. They are in a free association with the United States, which means they have signed a compact of free association that provides aid, it provides mutual defense, it includes provisions that allow for migration. And uh, for those of you who just noticed, there was a, a map of, that the Japanese uh, developed in 1890 in which they sort of built out this plan of, of islands and defensive chains there starting in the 1980s was a, uh, a similar map that, uh, that China has created. So this is, this is a picture on the ground. Uh, uh, this is a, in the outer islands of Yap. And it's interesting because uh, right there you actually have the, the literal legacy of the United States Navy. So this, uh, this little island at one point had a, a Japanese uh, watchtower that looked over a lagoon. It was uh, uh, liberated uh, and, and then the U.S. sort of kind of left some of their gear behind and it's, it's still there rusting uh, just right next to that uh, old coconut stump. So a lot of folks who may be aware of Micronesians in Hawaii um, and, and aware that Micronesians can come to Hawaii might be surprised to know how much the U.S. on the face of it uh, can provide or does provide to the freely associated states. And these three nations collectively receive uh, more than $230 million a year in direct aid. That is government to government bilateral assistance. They are also eligible for participation in a lot of cabinet agency programs. So for example, if you're a public school in Micronesia, you could apply to the US Department of Education to get special ed funding. Um, they are also uh, beneficiaries of a lot of shared services. So for example, the FAA controls their airspace. Uh, you know, so, so these two latter categories are not quantified in that $230 million. But the thing that's really surprising and startling is, is not just the amount of money or even the time. We had almost seven decades of this. What's really surprising to a lot of people is, is that, well, these are independent nations and they receive what is basically the highest per capita foreign aid for, of any countries in the world. That entire aid package and the entire relationship is not mediated by the State Department. It is not, um, America's professional diplomatic corps are, are not the folks here. It is the Department of Interior. Uh, and what I will argue is, is that both the design and the implementation, and Interior was at the table for the design and, and they control the implementation, is why on one hand we have all this assistance and on the other hand we're, we're not seeing the progress that would allow Micronesians to either stay in Micronesia and pursue opportunities there, or if they came to the U.S. be more prepared to succeed. Um, so obviously Micronesia ruled directly by Interior for more than three decades. They were at the table in the, the founding of Micronesian uh, independent nations. And they still, through the power of the purse, dominate uh, uh, everything in Micronesia. So this is, for me, sort of a, a, a just kind of a telling example of uh, the situation in, in a lot of Micronesia. Um, you know, here we have a sort of beautiful background, uh, kind of a little beat up road. And, and we have these two very simple cinder block buildings with tin roof, uh, a little bit of paint peeling off. And what these are, these are US government funded uh, buildings that house folks with U.S. government-funded jobs, um, and and they've got a they've got a little vehicle there that's it's actually a Japanese car donated by the Japanese Development Agency. So a little recognition of the fact that there are some other countries involved. Uh, but what we don't see here is U.S. direct investment. We don't see U.S. support of nonprofits, uh, and, and 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 we we see the U.S. sort of sustaining a model of governance that the U.S. created for itself and then sort of imposed on Micronesia. This is not of Micronesian design at all. And in the meanwhile, here's, here's sort of a, uh, the situation for, um, there's a, fam a family living situation in the outer islands of Yap. Um, uh, you know, the, we've got a catchment getting water off the roof, bananas, we've got a food source right there. You can see there's a, a little bright, but there's a, a woman cooking and a little cookhouse. And, um, you know, it is, uh, it is not a level of quality of life that as an American who's been involved that I'm, I'm particularly proud of or that, that I think that, that uh, is, is anywhere close to what, what these folks deserve. So here, here in Hawaii, um, for a lot of folks, this is their experience of Micronesia. Uh, they, they hear about uh, homeless Micronesians and, 
and and um, the reality is 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 that uh, there there has been a, a number of Micronesians who have moved to Hawaii every five years. Department of Interior does a census. The most recent in 2013 said that there were nearly 15,000 Micronesians. That was up from about 12,000 uh, the five year before. They'll do another one soon. It's important to note it excludes U.S. born, right? So if if someone from Micronesia can come to the U.S. through the Compact of Free Association, they have a family here. Their kids are obviously born here, so they are American citizens. Uh, and that's going to be really important later in terms of eligibility and opportunities, because while the compact was designed so that Micronesians could come here and, and receive many eligibilities that U.S. citizens have, they don't have all of them, but then their kids would. And unfortunately, there's not a good path of citizenship for those parents who might want to become citizens, even though they're allowed to stay here otherwise indefinitely. Um, the Hawaiian government has said that it costs taxpayers in Hawaii $100 million a year, local and state government, to provide services for Micronesians. And that would be everything from uh, a Micronesian who shows up without adequate levels of health care, you know, going to the emergency room, to uh, a child, a Micronesian uh, who is going to elementary school and, you know, uh, and so the state of Hawaii goes back to the federal government and says, you know, will you guys pay us? We didn't make the treaty. The state didn't. The federal government did. Uh, and so the federal government has this program called Compact Impact that is designed to help with this. But if you look at what Hawaii claims, and if you look at what Department of Interior actually allocates, it's about 16 cents on the dollar. Now, the state of Hawaii thinks that, you know, they're getting less money. The Interior thinks that they're claiming more. Uh, the other variable, which unfortunately people don't really talk about, is there is a net positive economic benefit to everybody, taxpayers and otherwise, when, when you have folks who are working and paying payroll taxes and, and things like that. And so that's a part of compact impact that, that isn't talked about as much, but I think it's something that should be quantified. So what about homelessness? Well, there's not a ton of data, but there are two good studies that have been completed um, by the state of Hawaii. Uh, and the first 15% of individuals across this state who receive housing services, rehousing services, or other supports uh, involving homelessness and, and transi housing transitions, 15% of those identify as either Micronesian or Marshallese. And that comes out of a, a study uh, completed by the University of Hawaii Center on the Family, and that's a year-to-year -year study, so we have a little bit of longitudinal data. The second data point, and again, we only have these two data points, so a lot more research needs to be done, is that among Microne surveyed Micronesian families, 16% identify themselves as either homeless or living in a homeless shelter. So the takeaway here it, for me is, is that these numbers, these rates, because that's all we have, we just have rates, we don't have numbers, we have rates. Both of them are out of proportion to the rate in which um, Micronesians are in the larger community. Uh, yes. And, uh, I, I want to pause here just to just over a breather, and uh, if anyone has any questions about what we've covered so far, because I know this is real dense information, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was just wondering, is Hawaii the only state that allows immigrants to come into it, or can they go to other places like California? So uh, this, is, this is what I was sort of alluding to when I said compact impact. On one hand, the federal government says, we're going to have this relationship with Micronesia. We're going to allow Micronesians to come in. And on the other hand, the sort of felt effects, benefits, and costs occur at the local and the state level. And so it is the federal government's policy that we have these relationships with Micronesia, that we're going to make these investments, and we're going to implement it in a certain way, and the Micronesians can, can come. Uh, but we're going to talk about it in just a second. Why, why, why Micronesians? choose Hawaii rather than some are, are certainly choosing Guam, some are going to the Commonwealth and the Northern Marianas, which is part of the U.S., some are going to Oklahoma and Arkansas and, and New York. There's, there's a lot of different destinations. But what we see is, is there is, as a, as, a, as a percentage of the total group, quite a number who are choosing Hawaii, which on the face of it, I would think, oh gosh, cost of living? Really? But there are good reasons that they are choosing Hawaii. Uh, but yes, in search of education, employment, and health care, they do have options. Thank you. Sir. The number in Hawaii just been published is 7,800 homeless. 15, 16% of 
apply to that number? So that number comes from what's called a one-day count, where people actually go around <laughs> and, and one day try to count every single homeless person. The one-day count doesn't involve any um, characteristics. I'm sorry, they collect information, but they don't publish the racial breakdown. The 15 and 16 percent, uh, one was a, uh, the 15 percent is the annual report of the providers of homeless services. The 16 percent was a Department of Health sampling of Micronesian households. The 7,000 number comes from this annually released one day count. They have questions about identification, Micronesian otherwise. They don't publish the answers to that one. So. I, you might try to generalize and say, could we apply 15% to the 7,000? But because the data sources are different, I wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable doing that. But Are you comfortable that it's not revealed? That those guys I'm surprised. I don't know, and I haven't figured out how or why that you could collect data and then not. I mean, it's possible that if we got in touch with them and said, could you release your whole data table? You know, sometimes for reports, we boil things down for reasons, but um, um, I'm not certain. What does 16% of Micronesians uh, being homeless, uh, comprised of homelessness people generally. What percentage of homeless people generally are, are Micronesians? That's what I just asked. So uh, in terms of the seven, what percentage of the 7,000? So we, we don't know. But again, all we have are these two little data points. So the first is of people who are receiving services for homelessness, they are that percentage. And of Micronesian households, that percentage it self identifies as either homeless or in a homeless shelter. We don't have the data on, of all people who are actually homeless, what percentage of them are Micronesians. And could I just ask you a little bit, going back to the beginning, <clears throat> why they want to leave Micronesia? There's nothing to do there? There's no economic opportunity? So we're going to talk about that. Okay. We're going to talk about that. Um, one more question. Yes. Um, the number of Micronesians in Hawaii. Um, Account excluded uh, children born. Right, because there you the count was done by census, so it excluded U.S. citizens. It was a count of folks who had a Micronesia Federated States Palauan or Marshallese passport, um, and, and that's just what there's written into the compact now. There's like this one little line that says census has to do a count every five years of fast citizens living in you know different U.S. jurisdictions. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. Okay. Any estimate as to what that would, would total? So there's going to be another one in 2018. Or if you were to count um, children. Oh, dependents. Yeah. I'd be just I'd be giving you a number. Yeah. It's totally you know. So, like I said, it all start. Oh, one more question. Then we'll. Yeah, just one fast comment. Um, there has been general improvement in the data gathering about homelessness. Uh, the point in time survey that you uh, mentioned that that has really remarkably improved over the last five uh, five or six or seven years so it's getting very serious uh, it grows out of a very uh, much improved communications base with uh, partners in care consortium from federal state and local agencies plus the private sector and nonprofit in particular so all of the providers, uh, which do break it down by ethnic group, it would be relatively easy and timely, I think, to get the request in uh, for the need for a more careful ethnic breakdown of you know the people that they survey. And in fact, I'm going to make that my mission uh, over the next couple of months because I happen to be on that board. And uh, as as uh, a member of the community. Well, that's great. All right, I'm going to push forward a little bit, and then I'll, and then we'll ask a few more questions. Because one of the questions that we just got asked was about, you know, sort of why why would you migrate? What's what's going on here? Uh, and and the number the foundational reason is there is a lack of opportunity in the freely associated states. Survey after survey of Micronesians who leave Micronesia, same three responses: education, employment, and healthcare. So on one hand most foreign aid per capita anywhere on the planet. On the other hand, these very basic foundational human needs are not being served. So there must be something wrong in the middle there. Uh, and what I uh, am, am, am suggesting here is, is that the way in which the money is given and the way in which that money 
that aid is implemented specifically by the Department of Interior is the problem. And some of the indicators are the fact that half of all federal, state, local revenue across these three countries is year to year Department of Interior controlled aid. And that 40% of the GDP across these countries is year to year Department of Interior aid. And that half of all jobs across these countries are funded by the Department of Interior year to year aid. So the Department of Interior, or we'll just say generally the US, has been in this region for 70 years and could have invested in developing out a robust private economy that provided jobs, a robust, vibrant civil sector of nonprofits that contributed economically to the community and, and perhaps allowed the Micronesians the autonomy to develop a public sector that met their needs in a way that's just not being met right now. Um, and so that, that hasn't happened. The way in which Department of Interior has structured the aid and the way in which the, their legacy essentially informed and populated the Micronesian government once it became an independent country, and the way in which by still micromanaging the money, they perpetuate these problems, uh, you can have this huge amount of aid and then still have people wanting to leave for these very basic foundational human needs. Well, the math on that aid was over a million dollars per person that lives uh, a year. Right? Now, $200 million for $200,000. Oh, sorry, how much is that? A thousand. thousand. A thousand. A thousand and fifty. Yeah. One thousand and a hundred fifty. So, you have, this aid okay. is voluminous. It is often at odds with what the Micronesians want, which is, I mean, just foundationally very condescending. Uh, it is crowding out private markets and civil society. Um, and it, it has actually devolved into explicit condensation, uh, con, uh, dissension when Micronesian leaders have gone to the Department of Interior and said, for example, this is a project that we feel is very important to us. And, and the sort of, you know, the Department of Interior says, oh, well, you know, we don't like what you did over here, we're not gonna fund it. And so there's actually money that is legally guaranteed to the Micronesians through the compact that Interior has withheld. And, and, and so obviously they're worsening the problems. You know, Department of Interior itself admitted in the early 2000s that they had made no significant progress towards the goal of self-sufficiency. Uh, and at that point, the compacts have been running for over 20 years, another 35 plus years before that. Government Accountability Office, a little more blunt, said both Interior and then resultantly their efforts set up through the governments of Micronesia had limited of prospects for achieving economic growth. I mean, you're sort of just sort of saying like, oh, it's not going to get better, um, which, is, which is just foolhardy. So this is, uh, this is a little public school on an outer island. Uh, in this case, an outer island of Yap. That's the in entire school population. It's a very small island. There's between 50 and 100 people there. But the way in which that public school is set up, uh, it, you know, it, imagine a, a traditional public school here in Hawaii, where you have several layers of administration and, and, and you have, you know, huge amounts of sort of ongoing training requirements. And because the way in which the money is structured, this school has to meet all the same sorts of benchmarks as a school here. So I actually taught at this school. And at any given time, one or two teachers or, or administrators were off island. And I was always just confused about this. I was like, oh, I bet these guys want a bunch of Verdi and they're gonna try. No, they were always getting all these various uh, qualifications and recertifications and all these things that a, a, a public school teacher, maybe somewhere in, in Kansas, you know, said, oh, you know, for my professional development, my district gets this money if I get these online courses or whatever, didn't have that. So, you know, we had given them this model that might work for a public, a suburban public school district in Kansas, not working for 50 to 100 kids on an outer island, um, and it, very expensive, not what, what they want, but it's being driven, the money, the legacy is driving this forward, even though it's expensive and it's not working. So the second step of, of that process that we laid out, lack of opportunity in Micronesia. Second step, easy entry into the US. In addition to all this financial assistance, the compact, which times out the financial assistance in 2023, has an open-ended migration policy. And I am not here to say that we should change that. I think that that is a, a positive thing. I think we need to change why people are choosing to migrate 
and, and the conditions that spur that, but I am not here to say that they shouldn't, because that is a treaty between two independent sovereign nations. And, and if there is a functional aid process and, and, and foreign direct investment and things are going well in Micronesia, it's not, it's not a problem. It's not a problem at all. Uh, they are allowed to come and stay, and they are what is called either eligible citizens or, or, or sometimes they're called qualified non-citizens. And it means that once, once a, a, a Micronesian migrant is here, they can do almost everything that a regular American native born could, right? So they probably can't own guns and I don't think they could vote, you know, but they could do a lot of, of the things that a regular American could, as opposed to someone who might be here on like a work visa or something like that. A little while back though, Congress started sort of picking away at this. So the Medicaid dispute here in Hawaii is a great example. So a lot of Micronesians were on Medicaid or some Micronesians were on Medicaid. Congress was kind of going through kind of a populist phase and said, oh, we don't want anyone who's not a citizen to get benefits through Medicaid. So suddenly Hawaii wasn't getting federal reimbursements. But, you know, Hawaii's government said, well, these, you know, it's still important to cover. And so they are, they are like citizens, but they're not citizens. And then is, if they have kids, their kids are citizens, but there's no real path for them to become citizens, which would obviously help a lot with both the finances if they were receiving benefits, but it would also be a positive thing for assimilation. Um, and, and again, the three reasons that they are consistently cited that they come here, employment, opportunities, education, healthcare. So this is inside the school. Um, you know, uh, we've got a couple of different kids with, with only, you know, two dozen kids at the school. You start consolidating. So you've got, you know, one class, maybe second, third graders. You know, they've, they've, they've got some pretty basic stuff. This, this school didn't have power because that, that island didn't have power. When it starts raining, you have to talk, stop talking because, you know, you got all this rain on the, on the tin roof. Um, um, but a lot of fresh air and light. Um, but again, this school was basically set up you know, someone in the interior said, we've got this model of schools in America, let's just give it to them and then we'll fund it and then we'll, you know, sort of slowly ease back the funding and have them keep up with the requirements. It, it wasn't like, this is the best system that we've designed for our own kids or, or here's what we need. So you got these folks, obviously they've got reasons to leave, easy for them to come. The third step is they're very disadvantaged as soon as they arrive, okay? Immediately, we've got lower levels of educational attainment. Um, we have fewer marketable job skills. Again, these are things that tie back to why it is they wanted to come here. Um, lower levels of wealth and savings. Uh, and of course, there can be language and cultural uh, challenges. For a lot of Micronesians coming here, English is the third language, right? Because each island group, different languages, a lot of Micronesians might, their second language might be another island. They're coming here, they're working on the third language. So among lower educated, less wealthy, Hawaiians looking for jobs, they're already sort of at the back of the line in terms of are they competitive, right? So in terms of cultural adjustments, this is the big city in Yap, this is Colonia, uh, got a two-story building there. You know, I mean, so just imagine if this was the big city that you came into before you set off, you know, looking for opportunity in Guam or Hawaii or, or the US. It's just, just gonna be a very challenging process uh, every way you look at it. But for those who come to Hawaii, the, the additional complexity here is the enormous cost of living. So a couple of years ago, the Micronesian government had a, a very, uh, a very versed, um, well-published Jesuit uh, complete a survey of Micronesian households in Hawaii. Um, Father, Father Hiesel, for those of you who know, I mean, he's the sort of end-all be-all in terms of Micronesian research. So what he found looking at FSM households, so that's specific to the FSM, not, not plow marshals, um, in 2012, the average Micronesian household here on Hawaii had four people. So our stereotype that some folks have, of, oh, the, you know, you go by the, where the Micronesians live, there's so many of them. They're... No, there's four people in the average household. And when asked the reason why there's lower levels of, of, of household size and fewer kids than in Guam and, and the mainland is surprise, surprise, cost, right? People were actually responding to the tough economic conditions. That average household had a median family income of $42,000. One third of household members were attending school and half of household members were working. So in that household, it might be mom and dad, both working, two kids going to school. Median hourly income, $9. Okay, think about the cost of living in Hawaii, $9 median income, hourly. At that point, the average uh, rent was almost $1,000 and three fourths of Micronesians surveyed were renting. So 
someone asked, you know, okay, you know, higher levels of employment than maybe some people would have suspected before the survey, what's, what's going on here? And, and one of the guys who was interviewed said, you know, looking at, at the availability of work, he said, unemployment's not a problem for us because most of the jobs we are employed in are avoided by others. And so I think about, uh, there are some Micronesians that uh, I taught when they were in high school a decade ago um, out, out in the Outer Islands of the Gap who are, who are now here in Honolulu. They all work at Walmart. They have these $9 an hour jobs and, and, and they were able to obviously overcome the, the, uh, the difficult challenges and, and they got a job um, and, and they're you know, working, working their way up. And so this idea that, that oh, the Micronesians come here and they have these huge families and they're not working, and this is, that's not accurate, right? This is a segment of the homelessness community that is importantly different than other segments of the homeless community. So that survey by the Jesuit, uh, at one point, I think he or someone sort of stopped and, and, and said, okay guys, uh, you're, you're coming to Hawaii. Why are you guys coming to Hawaii? Cost of living is horrible. You're telling us it's so burdensome to live here because it's so expensive. And what they said, they basically said Hawaii is an island and that for their culture and traditions and worldview, this was, this was foundationally important to them. And that while these same people are citing education, employment and healthcare, they are making that choice, remember we talked about they could go anywhere, right, conceivably? They are making it despite the comfort, despite the disadvantages of the high rent and the unaffordability, right? So they wanna be here, they are, they are working hard, they're taking jobs people don't want, they're working at high rates, um, but they are still having significant challenges with the same three issues that they cited that they left, the place that we're giving them tons of money to deal with the problems. So what, what can be done? And this is what I say when I said, I'm gonna talk at this at a really foundational level, really grassroots level. What can be done about Micronesian homelessness in Hawaii is to improve the educational, employment, and healthcare opportunities in the freely associated states. And I don't say that because I, I want them to stop coming here. I want them to, I mean, I, I think about the kids that I taught. Why was I teaching kids? Same reason anybody teaches kids anywhere. You want to help someone define and pursue their own view of the good, whatever that is, right? That's what I would want for Micronesians. And so that means you either give them good reasons to remain to pursue those three things, and or you equip them in those fields, so if they wanna come here, they'll do well for themselves. Uh, and so admittedly, that seems like a pretty distant solution to the problem of Micronesian homelessness, but that is the only foundational solution, that is the only sustainable solution. Um, so specifically, what, like, what, what would that even mean? Well, we need to replace this very condescending, very expensive, very effective bilateral government to government aid with guarantees of private sector investment that will produce sustainable uh, uh, jobs in Micronesia. We need to provide support to US nonprofits that are working in Micronesia, as well as local Micronesian nonprofits. Um, and then, yeah, there needs to be some public sector support, but it should be more direct and it should be built around institutions that the Micronesians identify as working for them rather than just being sort of a, a tropical copy of our institutions. I think, admittedly, we do also need to condition some of those aids on, on reforms to property rights and rule of law. You know, so property rights is a big one for me. So going all the way back to the trust terrier, you know, in the early 40s and late 50s, these American administrators go out, they're sort of like even before the Peace Corps and you know, they've got this really strong sense of what they think the culture is and they, they don't wanna change it, they think it's really good and they're making all these changes and one of the big things early on was we, you know, oh, we're really worried about foreign ownership of land. We're gonna make it very, land a very problematic thing. So it wasn't the Micronesians saying, we got this traditional land system, here's what we're gonna do. It was Americans who came in and acted on their sense of what that traditional land system might be, and then they sort of institutionalized it as this problematized area. So fast forward, when the Federated States actually gets set up, the legacy of that, as well as the individuals at the Department of Interior who are working on this treaty, you know, put in language, no foreign ownership of land, and they never sort of reform land property rights in a way that could allow for adjudication. So you might have someone who wants to start a small business and cannot get a loan, even though they have property holdings, right? And so you have sort of set up a structure that is gonna be very anti-entrepreneurial. So, so some changes to conditions like that that would allow people who have wealth of one sort to translate it into another for economic development would be a positive thing. And I think you just, you need to get rid of Department of Interior. 
These are independent sovereign nations. They deserve the basic respect of being dealt with by the State Department. They also would benefit from the fact that the State Department knows what they're doing and has a history of, of economic development and, and, and support of uh, countries across the world. Um, but just from a point of legacy view, changing state to the interior would, it would just begin the process of communicating to Micronesia that America values you as, as independent sovereign nations and we respect you and you're, we're gonna afford you the same respect that every other country in the world gets. Uh, and then I think we have to simplify the, the process of Micronesians who do come to become citizens. At the very least, that's gonna help states like Hawaii who are not getting federal reimbursements for certain expenses. It's gonna help them, but it's certainly gonna help with the assimilation. And it's gonna to communicate to the Micronesians that we take this free association seriously. We have a long-term strategic interest in the Pacific. These islands are important to us. Aside from the fact that they are important to the Micronesians, we have entered into these agreements because we have these overlapping interests. And, 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 and this is ultimately almost more of a symbolic thing than it is, um, you know, really, really a big policy change. Uh, one of the things I talked about in terms of aid is support for nonprofits. WAGE is unfortunately one of the only um, full time nonprofits that was created in Micronesia by Micronesians and is operating. Right. It, 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 if, if I, I actually had to think about this at late the other day because I was talking to, to the, the NPR folks here in Hawaii and they said, well, we're thinking about doing a segment about nonprofits working in Micronesia, reforming uh, healthcare education and employment. And I, and I was struck by what I've, I, I've known, but maybe hadn't thought about exactly in those terms. Is there are virtually no nonprofits in Micronesia. How, how could that possibly be the case? Uh, and it is because no one has ever, you know, Interior spending all this money, never made any kind of investments. There, you know, there, there was never an attempt to build capacity, um, uh, and there was never, you know, a way in which a young nonprofit, that in this case, using traditional skills of canoe carving and sailing to provide help for at-risk students after school, there was no way in which uh, someone who had a good idea like that could go and kind of get some technical assistance or financial assistance. What does build capacity mean? So, when, this, when the man who set up Wage kind of woke up and said, okay, I got two problems. One, I got a bunch of kids who after school are not, not you know, kind of getting into trouble. We should give them something good. Number two, I'm concerned, this guy's very concerned about loss of traditional skills. And, and so, you know, so he said, okay, I'm, I'm gonna build a nonprofit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna build something, some kind of something that's gonna solve the problem. And, and he literally, you know, there was nowhere to go in Micronesia where someone could say, okay, you wanna set up an NGO? Legally, here's how you do it. Um, here's, here's what governance looks like. You're gonna have this thing called a board. We're gonna talk about conflict of it. You know, their capacity would be, would be, and in this case, Habile, my little nonprofit, well, we actually helped them set it up and then we spun it off and it is a legally self-standing entity and they do canoe voyages and, and, um, and it, it is unfortunately, it's one of the very few nonprofits. And so in, in most any other country in the world, whether you call it a nonprofit or an NGO, there is a segment that we call civil society, where there is a type of institution that, that does sort of public charitable type activities. And it's just, it's, it's lacking in Micronesia, which is baffling because if Micronesia was sort of supposed to be this, this copy of the US system, there would be a very vibrant civil society component. Because there, but there isn't. So, okay, so that's great, Neil. You've got these big ideas about sort of changing the way in which America supports Micronesia, and empowering the Micronesian in Micronesia, giving people better situations so they can either come and be ready for the US or, or stay and pursue their goals. What can we actually do here in Hawaii? Well, unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, you do need to, you need to do something while you wait and hope that the federal government changes things. The reality is, is that the types of things that you can do here are, are sort of the things that you could do that would probably help all low-income people, okay? That would be things like loosening restrictions around the minimum wage so that more people can get hired. Uh, that would be lessening rent control so low-income families could spend less of a share of their income on rent. Reducing payroll taxes so people could take home more of their, their, their income um, and eliminate barriers to hiring new people. I think a school choice program uh, might, might also be a, a good one because uh, um, the cost savings of, of letting young people go to the private or public school of their, their parents' choice 
and the fact that sometimes private schools are better um, with with things like uh, limited English language learners or, or cultural assimilation, uh, I think that you'd see higher levels of educational outcomes. I think that uh, you know there has been some talk about you know there's this little bit of language in the, in in the compact about you know means of support and and unfortunately some people on Guam are like uh, you know sort of going crazy with that. I think that if you had a Micronesian who genuinely didn't want to be here and all that was stopping them from getting on the plane was buying a ticket, I think it might be possible that that is something that, that we ought to consider. I, I don't think that, that anything beyond a totally voluntary type of a situation it would even be worth discussing um, and would probably not be legal anyway. Um, I think there might be a possibility of some legal action against Interior because Interior has not kept America's side of the bargain. There are many things that the Department of Interior has done, including withholding large sums of money, um, that if they were adjudicated, and I'll give you a great example, um, uh, actually relating to this young lady. You remember on the very first slide, there was a little girl next to that building. So this is the little girl, she's grown up, still grown up. Um, so when I talk about Interior, I'm gonna give you this, this sort of crushing example. So. Uh, this girl's from the outer islands of Yap. She's from a, an atoll called Ulithi. There was a, a really bad typhoon. You guys might remember Super Typhoon Maysac, real rough, uh, a, a year or two ago. And uh, she was going to this public school that actually in the 1950s and 60s was sort of the crown jewel in Interior's uh, uh, thing. It was this well-funded, big, lavish school called the Outer Islands High School, and people would come in, and, and it was a commuter high school. And it, you know, unfortunately, it's, it's just, it, it hasn't been kept up with uh, because of these aid programs and, and, and the, the convoluted funding streams. So Typhoon comes in and, and sort of devastates his school, and it happened around, um, it happened around April. So, you know, what happens? School year's still going on. So they, they send the, the, the seniors into Yap and they finish their school year. But, you know, Bertha was a, Bertha was a junior. And, and so, you know, um, I, I wrote back to the family, you know, oh, you know, are you guys gonna be going to summer school or whatever? Oh, you know, we're still waiting on these basic supplies. You know, long story short, Department of Interior has up to $24 million a year that they're supposed to be giving the Micronesians to build infrastructure. And for the last couple of years, for, for more than a decade, this process called GEMCO, Joint Economic Management, where Interior has a voting majority of approving the individual process, projects, just kind of shut down. And so Interior allowed all this money to sort of rack up. And so I was like, oh my gosh, there's a typhoon. This will be, they'll break the log jam. They'll start, no, no. So finally, uh, you know, the family rights to Hobble, are the little charity I run uh, in, in South Carolina, you know, is, you know, Bertha, Bertha's not going back to school, you know, classes haven't even started, you know, could you guys give her a scholarship? So, you know, what Hobble does, and we're pretty modest charity, is if a family's got a bright young student and wants to send them to a private school, we will pay, you know, three-fourths, two-thirds of tuition, and the family will pay the rest, so they've got some ownership in the process. Educational outcomes at the private schools exponentially higher than at the public schools, because uh, the private schools are able to, you know, tailor their efforts to the reality of what the students needs, while the public schools are sort of operating as these phantom U.S. public districts. So, uh, you know, essentially what we were able to do with Bertha for less than the per pupil student funding the US government was giving for her to go to public school that wasn't even operating. We got her into, we got her into a Jesuit school um, and she's going, going to Jesuit high school. Uh, and so this summer she came to the US and uh, you, know, you can see she met the, Congress, the congressman from Joe Wilson uh, from South Carolina. That's the congresswoman from American Samoa. We thought it'd be neat for her to meet an empowering, accomplished island woman you know, here working in the US political system you know, there she went and saw the, saw the capital. And the thing that was really interesting to me, um, so, you know, the kids who get Hobbley scholarships and the kids in the canoe projects and, 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 and other folks who help us to get these t-shirts. And so she always, she always, oh, my Hobbley t-shirt is really good and stands up to the wash and, and I, like, I like how it fits, you know, like real practical. So I was like, you know, Berta, um, let's go check out, let's go check out where they make these because one of the things that she did over the summer was she took these courses at uh, the Art Museum and at, and at USC Honor College, and one of them was a, was a silk screening process. So she learned about silk screening, I was like, you know, you know that's, that's how you make the t-shirts. And so she went, and this picture here on the bottom left is, um, is, is her looking at 
and talking to this guy, this small business guy, it, it, who started up his own t-shirt making company. And for her, she's standing there, and the wheels are sort of turning, but honestly, this was as foreign to her as everything else here. The idea that she, this guy is saying, you could grow up and start a business, you have these capital costs, you got labor, we're gonna talk about, you know, was unfortunately as foreign as when, uh, you know, we sent her to the theme park and she rode a roller coaster. Right, so that idea, when that guy was saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna get some capital, you're gonna you know, make an investment, you're gonna do this, you're gonna find something for the end, was as foreign as anything else was. And then that was when it really hit me that our, the US's efforts in Micronesia are just not working. And now, I, I think that someday she very well could do this. Uh, and, and the point with her is, is that sending her to private school, having her stay with the host family during the summer and getting these experiences, not very expensive. Right? In many cases, lower than what the US government would be paying for her if she was doing the public system. Um, and, and, and the final thing I'll say that's really interesting about sponsoring kids is, is that I think it's a good idea because I believe in investing in human capital. If someone has the potential, let's give them the opportunity to realize it. There is someone who right now in Micronesia is identifying very intelligent, ambitious people and sending them off to school. That is the Chinese government. Okay. And that goes back to the map we saw with the lines in 1890 when Japan made its lap lines. And I think that if America thinks that we could just continue to mail our two or three million dollar check out every year, and then these sorts of problems that historically have been challenges for us strategically are, are just never gonna happen again. Um, but, but the Chinese are thinking about finding young people and building relations and, and, and treating them as genuine partners and we're just sort of keeping the lights on while they're doing it, we're definitely not serving the interests of the Micronesians. And there's no way we're serving our own interests. And so uh, I will answer just a few questions. And then I will let everyone else go, because some people want to go, and they've got other more important things to do. And then those of you who still have questions uh, can come up here. And anyone who has a question, or even doesn't really have a question and wants a t-shirt, I would love it, because some Micronesian might see you wearing it and be like, oh, 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 oh. Uh, you know, and then start a conversation uh, with you, because uh, it's, it's real cool among the young people. Uh, Let's give a round of applause for Neil. Yes, ma'am. Um, I tutor Micronesian kids, and uh, I'm really interested in anything you can tell me about the culture, because it's really difficult. And the public schools, I couldn't agree with you more on choice, because Common Core is deadly. It's just deadly. Well, first I'd say I'm not qualified to answer that. And there, there is a man here who both culturally and, 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 and titularly is qualified. So we are lucky to have the Consulate General of the, of the FSM. Uh, and he might be able to give you the, especially you can say, okay, I've got kids from, from uh, Koh Shrai. And, and I think that, that actually leads to something else that I, I just want to talk about real quick. Um, for those of us not from Micronesia, we just think about Micronesia. I think for people from Micronesia, they think about the Marshalls and Palau and, and you know, the Carolinas. And you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, a lot of folks in the mainland, we think about the Indians. But if you're Sioux and someone else is Blackfoot, they're really different. And, and so, okay, so, so, all right, so I just bring that up as a general thing where it's important for us to realize that these countries are countries that we made by drawing big lines in, in, in the map, uh, and that historically and culturally there are important connections island to island and chain to chain, um, but there are a lot of unique and important and defining characteristics about each of them. And so, I, so in the case of Marshallese, um, you know, the good news is, 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 is uh, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of sort of academic stuff, but there, there are plenty of Marshallese around. And so uh, I guess um, you, you could obviously reach out to the, the Consulate General from the Marshall Islands, um, or, or you could try to, uh, uh, you know, find a, maybe a Peace Corps volunteer here, former Peace Corps volunteer who served out there. But I, I, I think that, I, and again, I don't have an answer here. Your line of questioning is, is great though right? Because you, you're realizing that there are things about them that are maybe different from you as an instructor and your background. And, and, and again, our aid relationship is built on this idea that that's not true, that, that we're going to sort of set up governance and education and other things, uh, and that they're going to naturally sort of populate those institutions, ignoring the fact that there are these important differences. And so I, having taught 
classroom kids from from I taught all the way down to to Head Start K four and up to up to high school. Uh, you know, the biggest thing, and this is just a horrible generalization, is is that um, when I've taught in American classrooms, a lot of times we we really value explicit competition and individualization, right? So when I was a kid and you raised your hand, you got the answer right. Like people are looking at you and saying like, that's good, right? That guy, that guy differentiated himself and he got the right answer and, and he's sort of moving ahead. So in some Micronesian classrooms, at least where I was teaching, um, people don't, you know, like very traditional community-based sort of consensus-based kind of society. And so if someone sort of stepped out and raised their hand and drew a lot of attention to them, at least in, in some of the classrooms I taught, that wasn't always a positive thing. And so the idea that we're gonna get this like 1950s Deweyan style suburban public school district and just plant it out there and then send a couple Peace Corps volunteers and, and have some Micronesians who've gone to the states in the US try to run it forward exactly how it, it works in suburbia um, is, is predicated on, on, on sort of a fallacy. So I don't know if that, if that helps you or is consistent with what you've seen, but um, for me, it was about slowly building a dynamic in which, um, and, and Habile tries to do this, in which, in some cases, imbuing a little bit of, of this idea of competition and competitiveness and incentives. And so I, I think in the case of Habile with the scholarships, what we would do is, is if, if, if kids weren't getting good grades or were not turning in their report cards or things like that, they wouldn't get their scholarship anymore. And there was a sense that they were competing against these other kids to get the best grades, to get their scholarships. And we did the same thing with extracurricular activities. And this idea, for us, that makes perfect sense, right? Competition, uh, publicity, uh, um, um, initiative, and individualism. But, uh, you know, our, our, our practices, aid-wise, are not, are not built around that, or, or they're built assuming that it exists when it doesn't. So, sorry, that's not, not totally actionable. Um, but I would encourage you to find. I've just been a little bit lady who's going to help me. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, the, so outreach right there, right? Yeah. So, and uh, okay. I saw another question over here, sir. Yeah, so I'm a little confused about the origins of the contact with this location. Uh, just somewhere in, in the back of my mind, I remember something about compensation for atomic testing that took place. Is this part of that? Separate issue. Totally separate issue. So, after the war, all right, so keep in mind. Spain had had this whole region. They were just driving their galleons to the Philippines to get ore and come back. This was theirs. They didn't go through it. They went up by Guam. They didn't do anything. Okay. The uh, the Japanese obviously, you know, had this sort of plan. The strategic. Uh, the U.S. knew that they had this plan. Okay. So when America fought a war with Spain and won. This was back when we had, you know, the era of big war reparations. America went to Spain and said, okay, you got to finance this war. This is when America didn't have big taxes. And uh, Spain said, we don't have the money. We'll just sell off these various entities. And so some people in the U.S. said, oh, we need, you know, especially at the Pen well, the War Department at that point said, we should keep this. This, is, this, could, this could, you know, this could be significant someday. And, uh, and, and they sort of, you know, said no. And, and then the, Jap you know, the Germans get it from the, you know, buy it, and then the Japanese get it. So after the war, the, the US guys in the Pentagon were like, hey, we called this, you should have what And so um, this was run as a trust territory. A small part of it was home to, in the Marshalls, some atomic testing. And so there are different treaties and, and supports that compensate the fact that people were picked up and moved and their, their islands were destroyed and their lifestyle was sort of broken down. Um, but the Compact of Free Association was after 35 plus years of America running this sort of as a de facto colony, they said, okay, well, you guys can set up independent nations. We're going to kind of tell you how to do it, but you can do it. And then uh, because we didn't succeed during the trust territory period of setting up the Micronesians in a way that they'd be sustainable economically, politically, uh, we said, okay, we're gonna, we'll give you another 20 years. So we, we did this thing called the Compact of Free Association. And then that didn't work. So then we said, we will do another 20 years. So obviously one of the things that I'm saying is, let's, you know, let's not give ourselves these sort of artificial timelines. Let's figure out what our goals are together and then sort of build a relationship around that. Um, and so um, that's what the Compact of Free Association is. And so sometimes people talk about the amended compact that was round two. A lot of people talk about 2023. That's the, the day the compact runs out. And that means the money's gonna stop going to the US, but some of the other things like the defense treaties, 
right? So Micronesia doesn't have a military, we take care of that. And Micronesians enlist in the US military. In fact, quite a number of them have died in Iraq and Afghanistan, fighting not for Micronesia, but for us. Uh, those things would continue after 2023, but the money would stop. So from a homelessness and migration point of view, you know, so people, people have asked me, they said, okay, Neil, if you still lived in a place like this, would you, would you migrate to Hawaii? Oh, I'm pushing everybody else out of line. I love that place. I had a great time. I love the people, but I would be concerned with, I've got little kids. I want them to get the best healthcare. I want them to get economic opportunities. I want that little girl to be able to open up a t-shirt factory, right? It's a rational thing for a Micronesian to say, I'm gonna better myself. The US has done all these things for my country, but they haven't worked out. One other thing the US has done for our country is allowed me to pick up and go and try to do it myself. And if that means they end up in a place with a high cost of living in Hawaii where it's hard, it's a double hit for them. But obviously what we saw based on the household, income, the household survey is they're trying, they're trying really hard. Um, and so I just, I would, I would like to see America do the right thing so that things are better in Micronesia and those who do wanna come here are more prepared. And I think we have a human reason to do it because it's the right thing to do for the Micronesians. We have a strategic reason to do it, which is those are the crossroads of the Pacific. That's an area of the planet that matters a lot. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, can I get, can I ask him and then you, because you got to ask one first. Yes. Um, from like a public choice econ perspective, what are the incentives, I guess, on the, the Interior Department and or on the Micronesian government or the FAS government? To continue this process. Yeah, so for that purpose, I would wrap the Micronesian government into the Department of Interior. Because you have to realize the Micronesian government was essentially constructed by Interior <clears throat> at the end of the trust territory, and it remains heavily dependent on Interior, both because of the legacy, the structure, and most significantly, the money. Okay, so from public choice theory, which is sort of like, what is an institution's interest and why would they perpetuate the status quo? Here's what it comes down to. There is no defensible reason that the Department of Interior is involved in any of this. So everything Interior does is going to be defensive and reactionary. There is no defensible reason that our relationships with Micronesia state to state are governed by the Department of Interior both because that's not what the Department of Interior was created to do, but also because historically they have failed. They have failed the Micronesians and they have failed the US in, in its own interests. So from a public choice point of view, Department of Interior is always on the defensive and um, you know, tend to be pretty condescending and defensive because when things go wrong, they can blame the Micronesians. But other than that, you know, and so that, when I talk about how Gemco is sort of broken down and there's all this money that's not going out, it is because, and I've, I've heard this personally from folks at Interior, they, they just have all these negative things to say about how, oh, the Micronesians are doing this wrong or that wrong or whatever. And at some point they just felt like maybe if they cut some of the money off and there's, there's no one who's kind of calling them out on that. So from a public choice point of view, this is about sort of defending the status quo if you were setting up the federal government and you were like, oh, where does the relationship with Micronesia go? Department of Interior is sort of like, among cabinet agencies, it is sort of the junk drawer of the federal government. It has a bunch of stuff that probably all belongs in other places. This is a perfect example. Sir. Oh, oh. Well, is there an analogy to the Bureau of Indian Affairs? Or? It is also within Interior. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, so, do you mind, sir? Sorry. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you. Um, maybe, I should first of all take this opportunity to uh, uh, thank the Grassroots Institute of Hawaii through you, Neil, for uh, having us here. I really appreciate very much being here. And I'm glad to see uh, Josie Howard, who is the program director for a while. We are also, yeah, also being part of this. Uh, I, I have much appreciation for your uh, presentation. The, I am pleased that you uh, sort of cover some of the historical background because without the historical background, we will not be able to contextualize what you've been saying about uh, the, the challenges that we face at home 
as well as the challenges that we face here, including homelessness. And homelessness was the issue that captured my eye. Uh, when uh, I saw that you were going to say something about this, I said, oh, maybe that's a, because it's really a problem. Yeah. Uh, on the statistics, I've heard several statistics, yeah, but uh, the uh, main issue is the fact that, that there is homelessness here and uh, that we need to deal with. And I agree that the opportunities back home can certainly play a lot of role in stemming the uh, influx of Micronesians uh, uh, into Honolulu and other distant places. Uh, yeah, Honolulu is one of the preferred uh, uh, sites where Micronesians want to migrate simply because of the distance, because of the island nature, mm -hmm. island environment, uh, and uh, what have you. Um, you know, the other difficulties that we have back home is the fact that we don't, we do not have any vocational schools. Hmm. You know, Pats. You've heard about Pats. Yeah. Pats was one of those Jesuit schools that just uh, didn't exist anymore. It just it, it it disappeared after a while. Uh, but they did good job. They did good work in uh, producing some of the most skills, uh, uh, carpenters, uh, mechanics that that we used to have. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the challenges that we need to uh, address back home is vocational schools, not just the, uh, the academic schools like uh, Xavier, Perea, and Saramanchu. Yeah, so uh, uh, I, uh, I want to thank you for, for this opportunity that you have extended to us. And uh, uh, of course, we look forward to uh, uh, engaging the future of this. On, on kids, the lady here was talking about the challenges that she faced with the, our children here. Again, you're, you need to understand the history of our country. We changed from a subsistence economy to a monetized economy. That makes work, job, looking for job that earns money more important. So that's the reason why a good number of our citizens migrate here to look for better opportunities, money-making opportunities because we can no longer exist back home with just subsistence farming. We have to have money to be able to survive in, in our world back there. But children here, the youths here in Hawaii also face tremendous difficulties. Uh, the, uh, a language barrier is one of those. You know, uh, to be able to uh, uh, understand where our kids come from. You know, kids, are, our youths are used to being very reserved they are not supposed to be talking too much when adults are talking. You know, um, they are supporting children, women, back home. This is, this, are, this is a society in transition. We're still transitioning. So we, we have a lot to learn about uh, the, the modernized world, or even our partners like the US system of democracy. All these we consider as being implanted in our country. You know, so we have to get used to adjusting to democracy the way the Americans see uh, uh, democracy. So uh, there are a lot of incongruencies, societal incongruencies. So our children here will uh, naturally, not just children, but even our adults, will naturally face difficulties, not only to cope with the English language, but your school system, your school system as a well. whole. So I would uh, suggest to the lady here that uh, uh, not only that he talks to the counselor, but also to our nonprofit organizations like Wow, because uh, I've taken some time in visiting some schools who actually ask me to go and talk to them about some of the uh, problems they face with Micronesian youth, especially those from Micronesia, the United States of Micronesia. And I've done that. But the first thing that I ask them is, have you talked to the parents? The counselor cannot do better than the parents. It has to start from the parents here first. Yeah. But the parents themselves face challenges on their own. So we're seeing some very uh, uh, difficult times in the, uh, the children adjusting to their parents and vice versa. Yeah. So, yeah. thank you. I just want to add those. Okay, well, um, I think we're rounding the, the end of the presentation here, but if you have questions for uh, Neil or uh, anyone else, uh, please stay after, and uh, thanks so much for being here. If you'd like to be a member of the Grassroot Institute, we, we brought Neil out here, um, and it takes uh, it takes your support to help that happen. So please consider joining or making a generous uh, year-end donation. 
Um, you can see Kelsey in the back for that. And in January, we're having two big name speakers coming out. Um, and if you'd like to find out who they are, you can uh, sign up for our newsletter um, on our website. So um, anyways, uh, thanks so much for being here. And let's give another round of applause. Thank you.